we want to talk about first love this morning. And we're in the book of Revelation. We're starting a series entitled Back to the Future, Fuel for the Journey, Faith for the Jump. And quite often when we come to a new year, we reflect, we go back, and we evaluate the lessons of the last year or last season, and we build on those learnings to create a better tomorrow. Isn't that right? Do you do that? I was in my small group this past week with about seven, or seven men, and one of the guys said, we don't do that. Men just move forward. We just move on. We keep doing. And as we reflected, and I've been doing this with a number of groups, pastors and leaders and different ones, men need to reflect more. And all the women say it. Amen. 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 If we don't go back and learn from what just happened, we quite often won't seize the future God has for us. We need to keep focusing on the future and not just stay stuck in the present or be bound by the failures of yesterday, but we also need to go back to realize God has a progressive vision, purpose, and a future for all of us. He never wants us to remain static. And so in the book of Revelation, which is a book about the future, the great apostle John is on the island of Patmos, and he's there because he'd been exiled as persecution for his faith. They tried to boil him alive, history says, but Jesus saved him from that, so he got out of the boiling cauldron, and they said, we'll just isolate this guy where he can't preach. Well, he began to write, and he had a heavenly visitation. Jesus appeared to him, angels. Whether he was caught up to heaven or not, we don't know, but he did see the future. But before he saw the future, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, he hears commendations and cautions for believers that were represented in seven churches or categories that transferred generationally and dispensationally to us today. The first message of these seven letters in the book of Revelation, the seven churches or groups of believers, which were to be circulated throughout the churches in Asia, was written to the mighty church of Ephesus. Ephesus was a large church at its peak, maybe 50,000 people in a number of locations in a great city that was the capital of Asia, the major commerce center. It had one of the seven wonders of the world, Artemis, the goddess Diana. They worshiped through temple prostitution. I, I know that kind of boggles your mind. In that culture, a great church was planted that had matured, but it had lost its fire. And so, Jesus is talking to this church that I believe is one of two churches in the book of Revelation in the second and third chapters that speak about the church in the West and America, in my opinion. And he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. These are the commendations. But, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, this is the response Jesus is calling for. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. So remember, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Whoa, what a contradiction, what a tension. First he commends them. This is a church that has matured, it has grown, it has become healthy, it is strong, it is known with a resume that was second to none. But this is the first letter he writes to this church that on the outside was, that's the bomb. But they had gotten comfortable. They were good at management and maintenance and the routine of church, the routine of religiosity. They corrected apostles. They were good in theology. They were good with everything of doing church right, but they had lost what Scripture says is their first love. And what scholars say this relates to two things. They had lost their passionate, intimate devotion to Jesus directly. That comes through prayer and worship. The second thing, they had lost the mission of loving each other and extending that love 
to lost people far from God around them. It became all about them. It became all about their comfort. It became about rearranging the deck chairs, making sure the carpet was clean, making sure that people, you know what I'm saying? Making sure the walls were white, making sure the lights were, the fog machine was working. Okay, you get the idea. But they had lost something. They had lost fire. See, when we receive Jesus Christ, what happens at first, right? Passion moves us to fervently pray, serve, and reach out to others. It's like, our relationship to Christ, the Bible says, is like marriage. How many of you are married? Good. How many of you are happily married? Oh, that's pretty fast. Not bad for the New Year's Day crowd. All right. How many of you have been married f less than five years? Okay, you don't count yet. Okay. Uh, how many of you have been married ten years and more? It's harder to keep the fire, right? Nothing like a good fight to keep the fire going. I've been married almost 37 years. Let me tell you, that relationship is tested. And there are times the fire is hot and the fire is not. Oh, just my marriage then. <laughs> well, our relationship to Jesus is like that. There's time when the fire is, is burning and, and there's times when it's yearning. The problem with the church at Ephesus, it wasn't going, the pilot light wasn't going back on. That's why Jesus was very severe with them. He says, you have a lot, you know a lot, you've done a lot, but your fire's not. And he's creating a sense of urgency. He says, with what I've called you to be and who, who I've called you to be and what I've called you to do, you can't go on yesterday's adrenaline. You can't go on your history or your resume or your knowledge. You can't go on your logic and what you've done and your ability. And so you need fresh fire. See, over time, over time, what happens is we can downshift from passionate mission and we can move, live by what we call a passive type of maintenance and we patiently sort of endure. And that's what happens. We believers, we come and our goal becomes to get our parking space and get to the seat that we love to sit in. But we forget that these seats are for those that maybe are in the family, but they're not here and discouraged and need an encouragement. Or they're far from God and not, they're not yet brought to Christ. We forget that. The great Ephesian church had forgotten that. So much so, they had everything going by momentum of the past. Prayer became secondary. Loving others outside of the church became optional. And Jesus is saying, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove you and I'm going to replace you. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We are called to a great and a mighty and a noble mission. It's called the Great Commission to take the gospel and to win the world. Can I hear an amen? But they had gotten to the place where the goal probably was to get to church and not be the church. And Jesus said, look, that's not what I've called you to do. In the church in America, we've gotten that way. And so we have, we have a president named Donald Trump who actually acts like Donald Duck sometimes. Look, I voted for him. I'm going to be honest with you. But because I voted for him doesn't mean I like him. I voted for him because that's what I felt the Lord tell me to do. But now I'm obligated to pray for him because we have the presidential candidates, Hillary versus Donald, because that's the condition of the church. The church refusing to be salt and light and concerned only about its attendance and its programs in the walls were not changing the culture around them. That's what he was telling Ephesus. Ephesus was the capital of Asia at that time. And he was saying, repent or be removed and be replaced. My calling is without repentance. And as we start this new year, I'm gonna, we're going to open the altars today to allow ourselves to rededicate ourselves to the Lord. We had 100% of the people in the first service come to the altars and receive the Holy Spirit with a fresh touch this morning. And we're going to do that here this morning as well. We're going to dedicate this year and dedicate our lives for a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to come. Now, he here's what happens. We fall in love, but we can fall out of love. Isn't that true? Because our tanks get empty and we run on empty and we don't realize we're running on empty and fumes 
because the vehicle keeps going. And we're just running on yesterday's fumes, we're running on the glide momentum of yesterday, but there's no pop. In the once fiery Ephesian church, God wanted to light a burning platform under them and create a state of urgency because they were about to lose their calling. They are about to lose that coveted place of assignment. And he wanted them to move quickly, uh, to move to catch some fresh fire so they could move fast towards the future that they were compromising. Because they were kind of getting, they were, they, this urgency was that they were running out of time. To bring it all into a vision, it, all into a picture, this series is called Back to the Future. And to bring a bit of a lightness to this, a picture's worth a thousand words. So what was the Ephesian church called to? It's, it was called to go back to the future. But kind of like this, take a look. Take a look to the screens. The future. Something you never planned for. You made mistakes, let your family down. But what if you could go back, change things, right the wrongs? You wouldn't be the first. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna, by the way, they're going to reboot the movie. They'll be Back to the Future. It's going to be rebooted and it'll be released. The first one, I believe, is next year. Universal Studios is going to do it after much fighting. But here's my deal. That's the Ephesian church. They were running out of time. The Lord is saying, repent or be removed and be replaced. They needed fresh, passionate fire because they were running out of time. And they need to replace lost ground and get on and go fast to the future. Grace Bible Church Pearl Side, as we start this year, we don't want to be in a place where the Lord says, um, you know, if you don't repent, you'll be removed, you'll be replaced. See, what happens with a 22-year-old church, we get comfortable. We don't realize it, but we start living our faith only for ourselves, only for the chairs, only for the... I mean, it is incredible how people grumble about the parking. Not you, you're here. But we've become consumers when all of a sudden we notice there's too much smoke, the lights are too bright, and the parking's too far. I walk. I'm 62. The hill won't kill you. It will help you. And I tell friends that I invite, park over here. There's parking because our members really sacrifice and they park in what is known as the structure. Now, having said that, I've made a statement. You know that you're getting older and comfortable when a statement like that bothers you. How many of you park in the structure? See, so I commend you. The next step is that space goes to the Ephesian mission. You know, next week we're going to have Joe Onosai come. His book, Power of Destiny, is selling like hotcakes, both in the secular market as well as the religious market. I said, Joe, I want you to give us destiny. He's part two of Back to the Future. Joe Onosai has done everything wrong in his life. I'm amazed he's alive. I'm amazed he's still married. And I, I'm amazed his kids love Jesus. But amazing things can happen when you go back. You catch fresh fire. Repent. Change your life by the grace of God. Get back on course and God is able to redeem anything. I mean, Jonah's, Onosai has been in Kekela Ward at Queen. He's been busted by law enforcement. He shouldn't be around. But if we're willing to catch fresh fire and go back, 
to learn some things, deal with the mistakes that we saw in that video, realize that God is gracious and merciful, there is a future ahead for you. But we just can't go through the motions. We just can't stay stuck in the present. We just can't be bound by the sins of yesterday. And this is a year we become unleashed to make sure at 22 years old we don't get old. We don't get old and the goal is the parking space and the goal is our seat, right? The goal is having our donut. The goal is doing the same old thing. God is calling some of you to do new things. Why do you think I leave here and go to Cityside and preach at the 11? There's new people there that I'm inviting. There's new people we're reaching that don't, will not come here. Why are we opening Kapolei on January 22nd with a night service even though we don't have the morning yet? Because already a core of 120 people are ready to reach out to friends and family once we set that thing in a grand official place. Why are we at Kaneohe? Why are we on Thursday night on the university, if you're going to hear more about this, on Vision Sunday on the 15th, why are we securing the art auditorium there on Thursday night and moving our Thursday night service here, which is about 100, 120 people there, because most of their friends, most of that group of college students, most of them live on that side. And so God is saying, fresh fire for a fresh season, which means he takes us out of our comfort zone and into the zone of destiny. So next week, next week, the reason we're bringing Joe in is so you can spread fire. And you invite people who were here for Christmas. Invite football fans. It's playoffs. Okay? He played for the Dallas Cowboys. Paris, Pastor Paris thinks he played for the Dallas Cowboys. All right? But we're saying, here's a chance to get back to the Ephesian mission. Here's a chance to realize we're not here just to go to church. We're here to be the church. Somebody slap yourself and say, that's just good preaching. Slap yourself. Go ahead. Go do that. Slap yourself. Who is it that you're to give first love to? We want to start this year not making it about us. We want to re rededicate fresh devotion to Him, and we want to just get back. So, what do we do? What do we do? We remember, we remember without fresh fire in our lamps, will never accomplish the mission for our lives. Never happen. Because we can't do it by human strength. Jesus' last words, among his last words before his ascension to the Father, after his uh, resurrection, his crucifixion and resurrection, the disciples were excited. They were excited with spirit-led excitement, but human excitement and enthusiasm. And so he's talking to them, and he says, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They wanted to go. They had seen the risen Christ. They were excited. But Jesus knew that on human enthusiasm and alone, this wouldn't work. But you will receive power, dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus likened the power of the Holy Spirit to being baptized with fire. We had seen a lot of fireworks. I'm going to go back home today to more fireworks. Some of you live in normal neighborhoods. You're going to go back to quiet, peace, and sanity, and football. God bless you. But let me tell you, I think God put me in the hood in Pearl City to, to remind me, never, ever lose your fire. Never, never, never. Never turn to smoke. You should come to my house today. I invite you. 1480 Holy Circle, Google it. Everybody has an app, come by. I'll wait for you. Come to the fire! But some of you go to gated communities, I get that. <laughs> You're going to go into your man cave and watch whoever's playing. You're going to eat a sushi, maybe drink a mochi soup, I don't know. Right? Maybe smoke a nut, you better not. I go home to fire. I go home to a drugged out dog. When I, I guarantee, I go, in a, I go I enter Holy Circle, I enter Beirut. And I want to make sure you never let your fire go out. That is the warning to this church was the, that was the premier churches of the seven that are addressed in chapters two and three of the book of Revelation, the book of the future. He's saying, you look good on the outside, but you're compromising your future because there's no fire on the inside. 
That's why he said, when Jesus get back to first love, guess what Jesus was saying? It was get back to vertical devotion and horizontal commission. That's what he was saying. And the church in the West has got to get the gospel out. We we'll close with this, and I want to just tell you a story, and then we're going to open the altars. Jesus is saying to us as we start this year, remember, what were the lessons we've learned last year? We build on those lessons. We reflect, we remember, and the things we've done wrong, like we've seen in the clip, or what Pastor Joe will tell us next week, that will blow your mind, we've got to repent from the things that have held us that are wrong. Turn away from them and return to the deeds of our first love. What is that? Serving, sharing our faith, praying, getting into the Word, staying in the Word, giving, and passionately extending the gospel, establishing believers, equipping disciples, and empowering leaders. And some of you are called to lead where you've been following. This year, the greatest moments of your life will come when you step beyond your comfort zone. The greatest moments of your life await the taking of risk. It's never management. The Ephesian church had got into management and maintenance of churchianity. And God was saying, because I love you, because I love you, I remind you, get back to your first love. Get back to that or you'll lose your place. You'll lose your place. You'll be removed and you will be replaced. I want to give you a picture of two evangelists up there. You'll know them well. The one on the left, his name is Charles Chuck Templeton. Not many of you know who he is. The one on the right, who is that? A young Billy Graham, who's nearly 100 years old today. He's never lost his love for Jesus, even after he lost his beloved wife, Ruth. Um, let me talk to you about Chuck Templeton. Uh, Chuck Templeton was before Billy Graham. They were very good friends, coming out of the great Youth for Christ movement. The Second World War in 1941, bursting on the scenes as flaming evangelists. The one that was more talented, they said, the more, one that was more charismatic, the one that had more, in fact, more anointed, some would say, was Chuck Templeton, who was a sort of a mentor to Billy Graham. Let me tell you what happened to Chuck Templeton. He went to Princeton Theological Seminary to deepen his faith, planted a church in Toronto, Canada, a church that exists today that became part of the missionary, the legendary missionary alliance, the vision of which was to reach the world with the gospel. But Chuck Templeton lost fire. He began to lean on logic and intellect. And something strange happened along the way in conversations with Billy Graham. He went from being a fiery, faith-filled evangelist to becoming an agnostic. And then from being an agnostic, he became an atheist and concluded God does not exist. How does that happen? How does a person that was almost like a mentor to Billy Graham fall and lose his place? Billy could not reach him. In, 19, in, 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 in 2001, Chuck Templeton died. They were about the same age. Chuck Templeton died. Before he died, he wrote what was called a landmark book. And here's the picture of the book before he died. Farewell to God, my reasons for rejecting the Christian faith. This was his last work before he went to sleep forever. He lost his place. You know what Billy Graham said? I became the one that took the place of the man that should have had my mantle. That was Chuck Templeton. This is why Jesus was talking to the Ephesian church, that they are, who are so high and have so much can lose it all. Today, on the, in contrast, let's look at Billy Graham in action. This is just a couple years ago. Nearly a hundred years old, still going strong because he had not lost the fire of his first love. His passion for people far from God. He's calling here in My Hope America, calling America back to God, back to its faith, back to its foundation, back to the fire of the gospel. You say, it can't happen. Why was Jesus talking so strongly to the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation? Because that can happen. They who are so high and so mighty and so called and so anointed can lose everything because it's not, just, it's not just logic, it's faith and it's fire. It's the Spirit of God that brings a revelation that keeps your heart alive. I wake up every morning and I look at my wife. 
And I say, how in the world does she love me? Maybe you're asking that question yourself. I don't know. God. But there's things you do to keep the fire burning. You pray. You read the word. You share your faith. You serve. You give the things of discipleship. And today, we're going to open the altars after we sing a few strains as the worship team leads us. I look at Billy Graham. He's nearly 100 years old, still speaking, still writing. Why has God allowed him to live? Because we need to hear his voice through a man that's a living example of integrity and purity and passion who's preached the gospel to more people ever in the history of Christianity. And God says, you can be like that. You can be like that if the fire stays alive. Would you stand with me? Let's worship him. This first service of the new year, let's worship him and give him praise. Jesus, tell it to him, we love you. Jesus, we can lift the lights just a little it's a little too dark yeah just good just take it up a little. that's it right there right there here's what I'd like for us to do I'd like for us to sing the strains of this again but in the days of the church at Ephesus they didn't have the bass guitar and the drums and the guitar uh, the keyboard not even the tambourine lady hopefully but they had the voice and nothing is more beautiful to me than the symphonic, God-given voice in the vocal cords that we have. And I'd like for us to sing this a cappella. And the beautiful worship team will be you. Karaoke, a cappella. Because here's what happens. Sometimes you're here and you're letting them worship for you. We need to worship together. Will you sing together? Jesus, we love you. Let's do. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one That was so incredibly sweet. Thanks for joining us. Visit our website at pearlside.org for more.